Morning, everybody. We are here yet again for another episode of Leaders Connect, um, an initiative by ARCA Leadership. Le ARCA Leadership is a movement to inspire people to live with authenticity. It is a collaboration of senior HR leaders, professional coaches who have experienced and are passionate about living with authenticity. We are the movement has been started by Ashu Khanna, a chartered accountant who has now been leading this movement and you know, developing leaders to live life authentically. Uh, this movement actually has been inspired through her journey of transformation of the last 15 years. For the last, you know, for an organization so young, we are really fortunate and grateful to have a partnership with TOSB and other premier organizations as our outreach partners. TOSB is an online platform with leading experts offering cutting edge perspectives and learning from their fields. The platform partners with global speakers and experts to facilitate conversations on the most pressing concerns and possibilities of the current world on topics ranging from storytelling to boardroom philosophies. Now, what exactly is Leaders Connect and why do we need it so much? Uh, I firmly believe that there is so much goodness in the world and somewhere I think we lose sight of that in ourselves and in the world out there. When we trust our instinct and we really live with it, we are able to rediscover, reconnect and rediscover the infinite possibilities that exist in the world. The whole vision to inspire and empower the world to harness and unleash this treasure by sharing stories and having dialogues with some of the most inspiring leaders is what we hope to achieve, aspire and achieve through uh, Leaders Connect. It's an online, it's a series of online dialogues with some of the most inspiring leaders from different walks of life, like sports, technology, media, healthcare, marketing, and more. We deep dive into one essential, all important quality in of successful transformation leadership that defines the leadership style of the leaders in these conversations. The series aims to build dialogue around qualities such as authenticity, emotional intelligence, courage, faith, trust, compassion, and more. Our outreach partners for this event are Beyond Diversity. It is a global think tank focusing on diversity and inclusion. They collaborate with institutions and leaders to create inclusive workplaces via consulting, mentoring, and creating awareness. Through long term cultural change and sustainable programs, they impact leaders, communities, businesses to be inclusive in growth and innovation. Since 2011, they have supported more than 100 organizations across the region and impacted more than a lakh leaders to promote inclusive leadership. On that note, I would like to welcome our speaker today, Mr. Anaswami Vedahish. Mr. Vedahish is a successful senior business leader with over three decades of diverse experience in the healthcare and FNCG domain, former MD and VP Asia Pacific for GlaxoSmithKline Pharma, and before that Johnson & Johnson. He has a strong track record of leadership development and building leading brands, franchises across various categories and multicultural location. Presently, a senior advisor in life sciences to global private equity fund PAG Hong Kong for investments in India, an advisor to set connect advisors USA and senior mentor for master union India. He's also the president. He has also been the president of organization of pharmaceutical producers association of India from 2017 to 20. Thank you so much, Vedish, for being with us today, and we really look forward to uh, a very insightful and deep conversation, and more than anything, a very inspiring, invigorating conversation, because the topic, living in possibilities, a strategic tool itself, creates a lot of intrigue and excitement in me. Uh, so on that note, I would really like to ask you, what does living in possibilities mean to you? Uh, so, uh, first and foremost, uh, is it is the voice is the voice clear? 
Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for uh, getting me on your platform. I think um, you and your team have been doing a fantastic job of creating such platform, uh, bringing various kinds of leaders, and I've uh, heard quite a lot about what you have done. So, so first and foremost, uh, uh, I'm a great fan of uh, lateral thinking of Edward de Bono. Uh, many, many years back, how I started off and the early part of my career. Um, you know, the, one of the biggest problems that we face uh, as a society is our limiting beliefs about what is right and wrong. And uh, when I went through a program by Edward Dibano, you know, it is so many, many years back, and it really opened my opened up my eyes on the concept of how uh, possibilities exist all around you, right? And very interestingly, the humor is the best form of lateral thinking. So whenever I find somebody is having a good sense of humor. I always find they're the biggest strategic people in the world, not from any of the jokes apart, uh, <laughs> the pun intended, but uh, the fact of the matter is, I think people can think very differently, which makes you to think, uh, un you never think that that's going to be the end when some joke is being made and you bust into laughter. As they say, uh, as they say, uh, humor, uh, is no longer a humor once it is said, because the logic is vertical. Uh, there's no longer a humor, but the logic is uh, by foresight, you can't see it, but hindsight, you can see that's humor, right? So many of the possibilities that we talk about, uh, it exists in different forms. The unfortunate part is that there are a lot of set of boring people in our world. They, <laughs> see, they see a vertical logic and they all get cowed down by conversation, which moves around this logic of what somebody has said, who said and what is said, and we rally around the bosses. And uh, we all end up in doing some mediocre job, right? Not from any other perspective, it's just that that's the way the world operates. Uh, it never encourages people to look at lateral possibilities. So one of the things that I always felt, uh, you know, there are two logic that is there. One is the water logic, another tabletop logic. Uh, the water logic is the one where when the water first drops on a sea of sand and it forms a revolute and then goes into the river. And every time the water drops and it actually drops into the revolute and then it goes into the river and, in the river and then goes into the sea. That's what most of our life is all about, right? It's all about water logic. Just because somebody has said in a company, this is how it should be done and that's the way it should be done. The table logic is that when a marble is put on the table and every time you drop the marble, every time it goes in different directions. That, in my opinion, is the possibilities of life. So uh, the day when organization recognizes, willing to listen and understand uh, as an individual, life is full of possibilities, organization has to think and recognize that tabletop logic is the way to go because you don't know who is going to come and disrupt your business. Unless otherwise you as an organization have not prepared yourself for the tabletop logic to play out in your business. So that's what I call it as a living in possibilities and it is a strategic tool. That, uh, thank you for that. That was very, uh... You know, it's very different start, I would say. So very rarely do people start on the note of humor. And I think that itself sets the tone for a conversation that says, 
it's a it's an art and it's clearly i un agree with you it's something that doesn't exist i think we get too serious to caught up in the issues and the problems rather than looking at that life is ultimately a joke being played out on us and we are so trapped in that concept called life rather than looking at it as a as a joke being played out on us we forget to enjoy the whole play of it uh you mentioned the word listening you know that because ultimately when it's tabletop logic it's really a, ultimately it all boils down to listening what's occurring there was it something that always that art existed in you did you cultivate it you know if you could shed a little light on that oh uh, you know it, it like many other executives and all of us start our career uh, for economic freedom, right? Uh, if, if no, nobody starts, and I, at least at the age when we started out, maybe in the younger generation may have a different framework. At the time when you all started, you know, our life is all about economic freedom, right? So if you can get a salary and uh, figure out a job that can get you to next stage of life, so at that stage of life, it's all about, uh, you know, making sure that you don't lose your job and make sure that you act very intelligent uh, so that people think that you're fit enough to be in the job. Uh, so, uh, you know, at a point of time, uh, fortunately, uh, I had some bosses. I, I really... Uh, you know, at, at various point of time, I keep reminding, remembering them. I send a thank you note to them. Uh, I, I'm of the opinion that um, there's a very interesting saying that uh, uh, Zen master saying that guru, ju, you know, the teacher will appear when the student is ready, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I find it interesting that I did find some my teacher uh, in my bosses who uh, brought in this whole concept of listening. Uh, when I was in a consumer business, um, you know, in consumer business, um, you know, before in healthcare and also, of course, uh, even in healthcare, but in the consumer business, it's all about uh, listening to consumers. And uh, my boss used to insist on me sitting in behind uh, what they call the one-way mirror. Now, I don't know whether it's still available or not. Those days, you sit behind uh, a one-way mirror and listen to your consumers and a focus group discussions. You know, I used to manage a, a skincare business, feminine hygiene, baby products, and uh, you know, the whole idea was to listen to consumers. Very interestingly, uh, that brought in a sense of suddenly you realize when you listen to people uh, and then start connecting dots and suddenly you get insights and particularly in the consumer business is all about getting insights like the magic bullet is in getting that 30 seconds commercial that we used to make and that has to tell everything what a consumer wants so obviously your segmentation positioning all the stuff happens but if you don't get your magic bullet of what a consumer is thinking, that discipline uh, made me to believe that listening is such an important, that I cultivated in every aspect of my corporate life, whether it's listening to employees. I used to be so diligent uh, when I'm sitting in a in my in a management board meeting or employees meeting, and uh, 1,000 people congregation, I'm listening to somebody saying. The question is, is here is that listening to understand rather than listening to respond. It's a very big uh, lesson that I learned. Uh, most of the time, we as a leaders, we're all trying to listen so that we respond very smartly so that people think that you're an intelligent boss. Uh, versus uh, listening to understand where the person is coming from and recognizing uh, the position the person is coming from 
And similarly, the consumer, where they're coming from, why are they saying what they're saying? That opens up possibilities of conversation, possibilities of new opportunities. Uh, it's, it's a brilliant mosaic that opens up. In fact, uh, I used to be a pain for many of my employees because I open up lots of mosaic of possibilities, which people think that you are creating too much work for us. <laughs> so, <laughs> on, you know, on a lighter note, I'd love to know if the same discipline exists at home with Saraswati and your daughter or, there or not. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, they don't like it anyway. So <laughs> that, that, that's too demanding. But, you know, I... <laughs> I, I, I guess, you know, I, I enjoy, the, the world is full of possibilities, right? Such a, we, we so get caught up with when you're listening to music, why do you need to listen to one kind of music, right? There's some possibilities of music out there. You know, I, you know, people say, what kind of music you like? Why do you need to get stuck with one kind of music, right? So the, the cutting, you know, cutting to chase, I think life is, is full of possibilities. I think we need to develop our bandwidth. Uh, each one of us, right, from early stage of life, rather than limiting ourselves to one way of living, to uh, living with possibilities, I enjoy every piece of it. Uh, that, uh, that's where I get my energy and where I get the excitement. So. So thank you for that. Now, you know, ex developing our bandwidth is obviously, like you mentioned, a discipline and art. It's a cultivated skill. Uh, how would you advise people in, you know, whether it's individual level or organizational or the youth to actually develop that skill and attitude? No, well, um, Ashu, I, I don't know whether I have explained to you before. Um, I know it's a, it's a big concept, but it takes more time. But I'm 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 going to try to um, uh, bring it to as simple as possible. Um, first and foremost, I think we need to stop taking ourselves seriously. Yeah. So I'm 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 not saying it as a as a making a fun of what we do, but I think. The starting point is um, the day when we re recognize uh, we, we, we are the cause of things that's happening around us. You know, the recognition of the fact that we are not constantly trying to figure out how do I blame things around us and externalizing all issues. Instead that we, we have the power to make things happen around us. I think that's a that's a basis of all the conversation that happens, right? If once you don't, if you don't get that, it's very difficult to live in possibilities. So first and foremost, baseline. What I sometimes, you know, I don't know. It's, it takes maybe um, what sessions to make that person to believe. First and foremost, we need to recognize the fact that stop whining, stop being a victim of things around you. And second is that you, we need to recognize the fact that you are the cause of what's happening around now. This might sound big. Now, you're not, I'm not talking about wanting to Mahatma Gandhi or a Nelson Mandela, but um, the fact each one of us in our own life, uh, we have to recognize that we are the cause, whatever is happening around you and the word that we give has a value. Uh, the conversation that we have, that the way we need to start respecting who we are. And when I say 10 o'clock, it should be 10 o'clock, right? So that means there's a power that we give it to ourselves. And so start. And after that, I think the possibilities is endless because you become the cause. Now, you got to choose those possibilities. And uh, I'm, I'm going to give a quick synopsis of strategic tool. You know, one of the definition that I I really pursue is the concept of decide. Uh, the word decide is a interesting word, like fungicide, homicide, and uh, pesticide. 
each one of them pesticide is killing pests fungicide is killing fungus homicide is killing oneself and this side is killing alternatives so when you do a strategic choice of all possibilities when you say i took a good decision that means you killed good set of alternatives before you came to a particular decision that means you have to create possibilities before you say that i have come to a conclusion that this is a choice that make that's why when you say strategy is a choice that you make out of various possibilities that you create when somebody says i took a decision of a two choice is no big decision how many possibilities that you created and how many of them you killed before you come to the decision given the time limit and all those stuff right so i i am of the opinion that uh, we all need to if i have to give a suggestion to people first thing is that um, remember don't be in a hurry to come to a conclusion unless otherwise there is an emergency uh, where decision is to if there is a fire you have to jump right now i am not talking about uh, emergency situation or a critical situation but if you have sufficient time find out what it takes to create possibilities think through random various techniques you know edward dibano has created a lot of techniques like a random entry technique and a lot of techniques are available for you to create enough possibilities and then start evaluating each possibilities and cut them out and say related to where you want to go this is the decide, decision that you took and take ownership of the decision and move forward and and then given a time and then there is an expiry for every idea every possibility and then you what i call the convergence and divergence first you need to diverge converge move around then diverge and converge like an eagle or a butterfly that imagery of an eagle or a butterfly actually uh, creates a very strong visual of an explorer someone who's willing to dare someone who's willing to soar and you know actually take an overview before taking a nesting in on one thought so that's a- absolutely a you know fabulous thing so how has your team responded to this concept you know when you obviously it's something that you imbibe and are passionate about have you seen challenges and any stories of when you found it to be the most successful way of doing something or when you found it the most challenging way of actually bringing it about yeah but you know one of the biggest thing that you will if, if as an organization right if you are to lead an organization the other one is an individual right when you lead an organization uh whatever you do create a possibility it's not about you uh so i follow this mickage model of 4e model of envisioning empowering energizing um uh, enabling and energizing model uh it's a very very powerful model where i've always found uh if people don't see what you are seeing there is no way the possibility is going to get uh, life so Uh, one of my effort in uh, when i run a, run a company is to make sure the vision has to be shared the vision shared vision is a very important aspect of um going after a possibility now if you are not going to if i have 1000 people working under me and each one of them don't understand what is this vision is all about if i am planning to go to mount everest i am asking people to join me in the mount everest they need to know the excitement as as much as what i have they need to have their excitement so that possibility cannot be remain with you so one of the exercise i do is enrollment enrollment of your organization on to your vision and if if they are not empowered to go after the end vision nothing is going to happen people are going to say yeah i understand but i am not empowered to do that many of the organization the leader sit there and keep giving gyan but the people below don't have what it takes to execute so first thing is to do is to empower 
the example is Mahatma Gandhi or Genghis Khan. You know, there are a lot of stories out there. And third is that enabling. You got to enable people. You can't be having somebody to fight a war uh, on the high mountains. And if they don't have a, a boat, but they have a canvas shoe, they are not going to fight in uh, big uh, icy mountains. The last one is energizing people. So you got to keep energizing people, giving rewards and incentive incentives to keep them motivated. So the best example is that I remember when I wanted to drive a obesity procedure, uh, you know, the one of the surgical procedure business. Uh, people felt that uh, there are no obese people in this country. And this is most about 15, 16 years back. And I said, uh, no, there are people, obese people who want solution. They are sitting at home. They are not, you don't see them in the malls, right? And uh, it was zero procedures. Today is more than 15,000 people have got surgery done. And similarly, when I was talking about in 1993, uh, carefree panty shields uh, was we are selling about when I was in Indonesia, it was only 8 million pants. 8 million pads and 1998 was 100 million pads. It's just the fact empowering the women out there to know the meaning of what it takes to uh, take care of the feminine hygiene uh, habits without getting into the details of it. But very important thing for us to understand is that envisioning people and help them understand. At the end of the day, you know, it's, it's not about you. Is not about whom you serve, right? If if you don't get to understand them, uh, if you don't solve the problems, whether it you are you you are a servant, right? I I call that a servant leadership. If you are if you are running an organization, if you are not a servant to your employees, you are not a servant to your customers, you are not a servant to your consumers, you are not going to win. Don't expect people to come and tell you what is right. No, you got to help them saying that you tell me what is right, I'll help you to solve the problem. So I think that's an approach that when you take, uh, act, act, you know, it's it's a what, what I call enlightened self-interest for a lack of a better word. Um, if they do well, you do well too. But it's not the reverse, right? Everybody is trying to suck up to you saying that, oh, you're a great boss. It's of no use. It's not solving the problem, right? Instead, you go there and solve the problem being in the front and solve the consumer problem. If they have a problem, attend to it quickly, right? Similarly, attend to your employees at the grassroots. Then you, you have a great greater success to uh, deliver. You mentioned servant leadership, serving. It is more about getting yourself out of the way and being very focused on whether it's the team, the customer, the problem, and not being completely embroiled on this whole concept of yourself. Now, that requires a person to be very, very clear and honed in on the purpose. And today, if you look at, you know, what COVID has done is brought out this whole concept of lead with purpose and pack even more into our faces than ever before. Now, here is where the many people feel there's a dichotomy here is that if I focus on purpose, will I have a compromise on profit? What do you think about balancing or really working through those? Oh, actually, it's a great point. So I, I talk about this concept called balancing between uh, Jan Kalyan versus pro profit maximization. Okay, so mm -hmm. and more so uh, in healthcare, it's it's uh, it, it comes out very strongly because typically in healthcare the Jankalyan takes takes a very higher position because that's how traditionally healthcare has been viewed in the world by the charity organization you know, the, the organization like Christian institutions or the Hindu institution, religious institution, earlier days, the healthcare has always been driven by people who thought 
healthcare is a uh, god's uh, uh, way of telling you to serve the people right it's a very reward reward uh, subject the unfortunate part is that you know a point of time um, people are living in, in 1947 when we gained independence and our average longevity was 47 today average longevity is 72 now we are cross 70s now there are healthcare has changed right well now you are living longer the living longer is due to various people who are come in the different ecosystem members of the ecosystem are come in and making that happen whether it is a pharma company whether it is a providers uh, payers Who come into the system and physicians, uh, playmakers in the system. Now the question here is that yes, you need to have the same reverence to the healthcare. You want to you want people to live longer with less morbidity or no morbidity. But however, there is a pay there is a pay attached to it. There is a there is a payment attached to it. There is a profit. There has to be people who are interested in making that happen. so now the question is on one end you have uh, jan kalyan with the public good the other end is a profit maximization and the question is uh, how do you balance this two how do i bring it to the middle what i call the profit optimization with public mm-hmm. good in your mind now this, that is exactly the point that happened in uh, covid if you look at covid now uh, it's a pandemic there's a convergence the global convergence on figuring out we don't die the planet doesn't disappear because of a virus and everybody putting their resources to uh, make sure that people are out of the woods the question is is it sustainable if you don't support now every members in the ecosystem Uh, are putting their money like for example i saw you must have heard as um, uh, you know serum institute saying that i am putting money uh, at risk some 400 crores 500 crores they are putting money at risk i think it's a great leadership that they are saying i am willing to put money uh, to get a vaccine at risk now no government nobody has said that we are going to underwrite your risk but they thought it's a great risk so businessman is putting his money and saying that i'm going to come up with a vaccine or i'm going to create a manufacturing site if oxford vaccine comes into play similarly bharat biotech has done the same thing along with uh, icmr similarly various other people the question is at the point of time if a society doesn't reciprocate um, people who are taking risk in solving your social problems you are not likely to get more people in future to come and do exactly what these people have done so in my opinion uh the the concept of syndicated risk somebody need to help people uh to solve the problem with the scientific community take it to go to market make sure that everybody in the country gets a vaccine or a drug now there's a money involved sustainability involved so rather than saying people are making profits instead we should say how do i make sure that you get you guys make decent profit but making sure society is taken care till that time you don't make that happen there is no incentive for society uh, to come and come up with a solution to solve future pandemic so i am of the opinion is that we need to celebrate people who take a risk who took a chance and put their money in in place at the end of the day businessmen put money for gain because all of them are green backs or whatever what are the colors that you say uh, we need to recognize them uh, for having what they did at the same time nobody should profit profiting or a profiteering if anybody is profiteering and making a fool of people i think they need to condemn we need to condemn them but anybody who is genuinely making a difference 
and we need to make sure that they are sustained. That's that's my principle of how do you, particularly in the healthcare space. So it's actually acknowledging that, Zach, thanks for that. That explanation was very helpful because what you are really that profit is doing is acknowledging the initiative and the courage of a leader or an institution to step forward and stick their neck out in a scenario where there is no, uh, they're serving society, the outcomes are obviously unknown, and yet it uh, the benefits are tremendous to the world at large. So that gives a very clear perspective, and you, know, you mentor a lot of people as well. You, uh, What qualities do you think are important in a mentor and a mentee? See, the, the, the first and foremost, I think um, uh, I'm of the opinion mentor is the one who should be a facilitator. Um, I don't think a mentor should not be a subject matter expert. I think uh, he or she should be a good mirror, um, a reflection of the person uh, who has some issues or a challenge. And the mentee's job, uh, because many times what happens is that when you said mentee, uh, you know, I could be a mentee, you could be a mentee for a particular situation. It's all contextual, right? Uh, you know, a mentee need not necessarily be a young kid. A mentee could be a, a aged person too. Mentee means a person who has a challenge on a particular context where they are not able to resolve an issue and they are struggling because they are not able to, they don't have an, one is adequate bandwidth or a, or a, a situation is preventing them from uh, rather having their blinkers to make sure they're not able to see options. How do they resolve challenge that they're faced with? So the mental job is to reflect and listen to the mentee and understand what they want to do, what are they trying to resolve, what challenges that they have. And to make sure that first and foremost, crystallize the issue itself. Many times the, the mentees that I've had, uh, I've always found that uh, they have not even crystallized their issue. And many times the issue is so simple, but they cloud their issue with so much of peripherals and which prevent them from looking at the real issue. The real issue is a, such a simple issue, right? So the mentor's job is to help them to peel the onions and um, give a reflection and make them to understand the issue itself. Once the issue is very clear, frankly, in my opinion, uh, the mentees find a solution. Uh, you don't even need to find a solution. The people is people are so caught up in not able to figure out. Uh, I always ask the question, Aap kya karna ho? Okay, <laughs> simple question, right? And that itself, then, you know, you keep asking this question. So what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Right? Suddenly you, they realize that it's so simple. So the answer is, just getting the problem defined very clearly. So the biggest expectation of a mentor is to help a mentee to identify the problem of the context that they are in. I think that itself will, will open up lots of solutions. You know, it really comes back to what Simon Sinek also says, the why. Keep coming back to why. Why do I want to do it? Why do I want to do it? And when you keep de-layering, de-layering, de-layering it. And actually, I think we make, you know, very rightly said, we make complicate life. Life is very simple. It all comes down to that bottom point of why am I wanting to do it and what do I want most of? Once we have clarity on that, the fog just disappears. Absolutely. Totally. I have a question here uh, from Spriha. What, according to you, is the most important mindset mindset issue that millennials are having to deal with? Uh, 
Yeah, well, in, you know, uh, it's it's a very broad question, but I try my level best because the, the, the so-called millennial, I have a, a couple of views on so-called millennial. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking what the right way, way to express this. Uh, the period that we came from, uh, where uh, we got to make our mark in life uh, from a, from an economics perspective, right? Uh, many of our generation uh, just country got independence and the economy was growing at three and four percent and you know where I paid 11, 11 rupees for my school, 250 rupees for my college and 2500 rupees for my MBA, right? So uh, that's the kind of we came from. Uh, the sense of entitlement was not there in our uh, time of life. Means for us, everything is all about, uh, I got to work and make, make my way through to get what I need. Now, uh, including my, my child or whatever, I think we are fortunate. The millennials are so fortunate that um, I'm talking about large portion of millennials. Um, there are some people who are not, may not be fortunate. They have a great head start where the families have provided the millennials a platform for them to look at um, not the basics of life, but the next stage of life. The mindset of millennials should be to do um, what can I contribute, what can I do differently, and what mark that I can give uh, in, in this world, right? The unfortunate part is uh, the entitlement mentality uh, has crept in so much in millennial, they are only talking about themselves and I'm not again I, I want to be careful about your future is so brilliant and full of possibilities I think if you ask me I never I could never think of possibilities in my life because of my possibilities were very, very simple when I started my career it's all about when is my next increment going from 2500 rupees to 2600 rupees right so because we are so bound by certain aspects of um, life, I think the millennial should pursue, in my opinion, is their passion and what they're good at. And their mindset should not be the fact that I don't have what it takes to do it. In my, in my opinion, they have everything available to pursue passion and what they are good at it. And what it requires is a commitment to make that happen, make the shift. Uh, the blessed population is a millennial. Um, I I would only, I wish that I was in the millennial where I could have done much bigger than what I've done in my life. A millennial is a fantastic stage of uh, century of our life. Uh, your possibilities are immense. You know, I keep seeing, Digit, you know, all kinds of stuff is happening in this world. So make a mark, take it and run and create an excellence in the pathway that you have. So I, I, I think they're all sitting on possibilities. I totally agree. You know, Vedish, if there's one thing I discovered over the last, uh, my own journey of change is that at some point, and it's not just a sense of entitlement, but a complacency sets in. Uh, you get so spoiled by everything that's provided for, you just expect life to work for you till it shakes you up. And I think in a way, much as we may, I, I do empathize with those who are truly suffering in the COVID, but I think it's been a big wake up call from the complacency many are sitting on, uh, that we really have the gift of free will and intellect to really work through and generate possibilities for ourselves. Absolutely.
So I have another question here uh, from Danish. How can you find your why? Is there a framework? No, it, it's a very, very, uh, uh, very important and very philosophical question. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I can give you a simple answer, but I'll try to give you an example. Uh, probably that will help Anish to uh, relate with that. Um, you know, uh, when I started my career, you know, like many of many of you at the early stage of life, you know, I was in an industry, industry without having to demean the industry that I was in. I was in the liquor industry. Um, you know, the big man, I, you know, I'm not going to name, and I was part of that thing way back in 1983-84. But I, I was not, um, though it's a very glamorous, I, I was making good, decent money at that stage of life. Something that was not, I was not happy in what I was doing. But when I, when my, 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 boss happened to meet me at some point of time and he told me to come to healthcare industry um, at that time when you said healthcare industry it's all government hospitals and you know going and doing business in a you know dirty government hospitals right and from glamorous to non-glamorous right so when i made the shift and i felt that there is a inner calling I, I felt that when I go to the hospitals, um, I was in infection control business. I was a product yeah. manager and I felt very interesting. Uh, I attended a bypass surgery, went for a training and all those stuff. I didn't have a clue as to what it's all about. But uh, when I started spending time, I suddenly realized that uh, maybe this is the industry I should be in. Uh, it's not glamorous. My not many friends. In the earlier business, there are many friends for me. Um, and here, you know, you go there and you know very well there's a there's a lot of suffering people and you go. So I and after that, I spent now so many years in healthcare and I never turned back. Uh, I felt so happy about seeing making a difference. And, you know, my get salary get paid and, you know, you are dealing with the right people and all the stuff. So one of the things that my recommendation is that why, you know, there's something called uh, to have, to be and being. Uh, you got to explore this phase for yourself. The being piece, uh, you, you got to ask this question. Is, is this something... Uh, where I get maximum happiness, you know, there's an exercise I do to my mentees, uh, 17 to 18 question, question that I do about the purpose in life. It's very important that I suggest uh, each one of us uh, explore where do you get the maximum happiness in life, retrospect, think about where do you, which are the moments that you got the maximum impact? There is some meaning in it. There is some connection in it. And I don't know when you will get the connect. Uh, I'm not going to demean which industry, what people are doing. But there's something which will make you feel that this, this is what I want to do. This is my happiness that I get. Correct? So that is the being is where, they, what they call it. In Chinese, they call it chi or a, you know flow. You know, suddenly you, your energy starts flowing. You become, so you are in the being stage. You start flowing and you enjoy, you dance, right? Uh, you dance in that space. So I don't know what it is for each one, uh, but you you got to keep pushing that line to see when you get your chi or energy that's flowing in which aspect. And don't miss it. Capture it and see that is there anything that I can do in my life. Now, obviously, you need some uh, people to help you out in making that happen. That's where I got that feeling, high energy in healthcare, where I felt um, when a patients are getting coming out of the bypass surgery, 
relatives waiting there and they're all feeling happy and you are along with the cart being wheeled out and you're standing there. You, I, I felt very good. Oh my God, this is not like FMCG, right? Uh, your brand is doing well. Yeah, great idea. But here I'm seeing. Uh, so it, it's about, I leave it to you, right? I, I, I explained. Uh, yeah, something. so it's really about what gives you joy and un unleashes that energy in a person. Uh, I have question a question from Anonym, it's I don't have the name here. Is there a way to identify one's own blind spot? Yeah, I, I think it's a um, it's a very very important question. You know, I I uh, the only way you can get your blind spot checked if you're working for a company or if you are in a you are young enough. You have enough people. Best thing is feedback. The best thing is to get feedback. Uh, like for example, in, in uh, the companies where I work, we have something called 360 degrees feedback. And uh, and 360 degrees feedback, uh, anonymous. And many times it tells you exactly your blind spots, and you feel dejected because you think no 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 that's not me people are telling you you know what you are an idiot right on blah 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 but you want to say no no i'm not so question is uh taking under wanting to understand a blind spot first and foremost you need to be ready to receive feedback about your blind spot it's not easy let me tell you the reason why it's a blind spot is that many times we deliberately decide not to look at that space. And uh, my my belief is that I think we all know our blind spot. It's just that we deliberately prevent ourselves from not wanting to know it. But from practical perspective, get to hear from people and don't be judgmental. Listen to what people are saying. And if they are saying, you are behaving like this. Now, what you need to do is that absorb it and see what I can do to figure this out. The blind spot is something we deliberately avoid. Uh, so, I show you 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 know it better. So, <laughs> I yeah, it is uh, living in denial. I would put it as simple as <laughs> I think we live in denial till the world holds the mirror in front of us. I have a question from Dr. Pramod Solanki. In the efficiency driven, driven culture of corporates, how easy was it for you to practice exploring alternatives and then deciding to act at various stages of your career? Yeah, so, I, you know, uh, your point is valid. Uh, every company is talking about efficiency. See, at the end of the day, you, you have to remember one thing. Uh, you are not exploring alternatives in isolation. You are exploring alternatives um, for the company's benefit, right? Uh, if you are going to explore alternatives in isolation, uh, not you are not going to get too much support. Uh, you're not. If you come back and say, uh, as I as I always tell people. Uh, working in an organization is like a, a performing surgery on a beating heart. Like, I don't know whether many of you may not know, it's called a beating heart surgery. While the heart is beating, you do a surgery uh, in bypass surgery, right? Or a, not a bypass, or a, uh, you remove the saphenous vein and apply vein on your heart. You can't afford to let the heart stop. So in an organization, corporate life, whether you like it or not, the corporate life has to beat. It has to produce profits. It has to deliver results. So let's not uh, 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 say that making profits or delivering quarterly results is bad because that's the purpose of an organization. Organization has to deliver certain quarterly expectation of the investors, right? Now, your job 
is to add value to this process by making sure that you are not talking something which is uh, which is out of the blue which is going to take away the interest of the organization so and this is where i call it as maturity has to come in uh, you don't you are not living in isolation uh, i have done so many things where i have done first and foremost for deliver what you are expected to deliver in the organization while having done that now pursue your alternatives so there is no scope for somebody to say i am pursuing alternatives but i am not going to deliver what is expected of me that's not acceptable in a corporate world that's an unfortunate part and uh, very interestingly uh, the day once you deliver the results uh, there are people wanting to listen to your listen to your innovation listen to your advice listen to your thinking but if you don't deliver result nobody wants to listen to you so it's a it's a very Bit simple of a to situation <laughs> alpa ashar has a question in my coaching experience i have observed one thing that people are struggling with is consistently working towards anything consistency how can one develop this virtue no i think it's again a very very important question um see we use the word consistency is uh, it's about belief um you know consistency for the sake of consistency uh, is not a uh, you got to look at the context that you are operating in right um the one which you are talking about is a sustainability is a one piece other one is consistency uh what people are looking for like i mean and i take an example of a performing uh, leader people want to know are you a uh, what they call it as a one trick pony or um, you can deliver this on a consistent basis so whenever i look at a leader when i am recruiting i only look for people have they delivered whatever they have say what are they saying are they have they delivered it on a consistent basis I mean is it a, a flash in the pan or do they have the enough muscle and skills to deliver that aspects of whatever they are saying so when you use the word consistency consistency in relation to ability to deliver a particular aspect of your skill when somebody says you know can you give me an example of uh delivery of results in your specialty you should be able to say two cycles of success tells you that you have enough muscle and enough enough power to have delivered that then i know this person is has what it takes to deliver this so consistency as a term if you use it uh beyond uh the framework you know uh, just to give an example is that my one of my boss used to say um and somebody said i have a 20 years of experience <clears throat> he asked a question do you have a 20 years of one year experience repeated 20 times or a 20 years of experience of having improved <laughs> Now, i think that that says it all it, consistently i delivered the one year experience 20 times has no meaning in in this world right so i i think i've answered it sufficiently so uh, it really comes down to constantly learning and that conviction to keep going absolutely so i have another question from uh, govindan sridhar the current pandemic has brought total shake out of labor market and skills how do you expect last two and future two generation should do to bring value and integrity uh well i i think the point that govind has made is a very important point uh pandemic is definitely changed the landscape uh our i don't know what uh, life stage uh, this person is in uh so my recommendation to you is uh 
if I'm in your position, if you're a youth, I think it's going to open up phenomenal possibilities. The most exciting future is beyond COVID. Uh, COVID is a, is a pause. Uh, like many times what happens in a pandemic is that, you know, you, the whole society figures out how to deal with that and there will be a solution that will come up. The world is not going to stop. So the first capability I would request you to have is optimism, uh, positivity, and the skills that that definitely I believe is a new age skill is in the area of digital transformation. I think um, um, there's so much is happening in the digital space. Uh, I don't know where, which all the areas. Uh, I keep hearing about um, AIs and um, machine learnings and all those stuff. I think these are all going to change the world. Um, in fact, uh, right now I'm in US. I was listening to a podcast uh, where the, exactly the question was talked about how uh, the medical facilities are going to change. Uh, by the doctor, they are saying, you know, no, all patients are not going to come and meet them. Uh, uh, many of them are going to continue to do the digital consultation. Only the critical people might come in the new world, right? So you are going to see, uh, if you ask me, get yourself uh, into capability, into business analytics. Uh, digital uh, world, uh, there's so much is happening in this world. Uh, get yourself into that space. And frankly, I, I don't even know. There are lots of new opportunities are going to come. I think as Ashu rightly pointed out, this title of this meeting itself is focusing on possibilities, right? As a strategic tool for all of you. I just don't even have a clue but make sure that you use a tabletop logic. Be ready. The possibilities are going to be so immense. You don't even have a clue. I, I won't be able to, as, as an elderly person sitting here, I won't be able to tell you what possibilities are going to come. The possibilities are immense. So I'm more excited for you guys more than uh, for myself. Uh, very, very well said. I think we are at an inflection point and the whole of an entrepreneurial revolution, I call it. I think it is going to be and we are actually moving towards an era of immense innovation and creativity, as you rightly said, uh, Vaidesh. And I think on that extremely um, optimistic, positive and note of possibilities, uh, I would be already over the hour. It's been the time has flown by with all this uh, questions and stories. I would like to say thank you very much uh, for a very, very interesting and insightful conversation with covering up, you know, ultimately it is about staying open all the time, staying alert and open and not being trapped in our own myths and beliefs and paradigms and just looking at the what the world has to offer to us at this point in time looking into the present and moving into the future unhindered unhindered absolutely so thank you thank you very much uh, for being here with us today thank you ashu i think it's wonderful i'm very glad that uh, uh, i could share my thoughts and i'm quite sure that many more questions are out there and um, uh, my the parting remark to people is, I think uh, the world is full of phenomenal opportunities, more exciting things to come. Pandemic is only a, a inflection point for many things to happen. So I know that we went through a tough time. Uh, we are going through a tough time. I've never, I could never imagine vaccine could be developed I've been in the healthcare industry. I know vaccine. I, we have sold vaccines. It takes eight to nine years. Today, pandemic has created a possibility of vaccine in eight months' time. 
So I have a faith in uh, our human uh, ability to come up with solution. Uh, the only thing I, I see is the phenomenal progress and great opportunities. So thanks very much for giving me an opportunity part of this session.